All right, next speaker is David Krakow. He is the director of the Santa Fe Institute, and um, I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Great presentation. All right. That's quick. Good. Can everyone hear me? That's clear. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Katie, for inviting me. This will be... Uh, it worked so well, and then it... Uh... Right. Um, a, a little different, and I'm interested in this general question of institutional change. Why do governments come and go? You know, why do companies decline? Why? I don't buy, John, this idea of immortal institutions. <laughs> the, the Roman Empire, where is it? <laughs> I was raised in Hawaii, in Portugal, and in London, and they were once great nations, and of course now they're all the shadow of what they were before. So this is the general question. I'll do it through a set of mathematical models, very simple stylized toy models, the sort of what Dan, Dan Dennett calls intuition pumps. And on the right, a more detailed analysis, a new five-year project on the evolution of regulatory and legal systems focused on constitutions. Um, so the two great theorists of change uh, in the 19th century were Boltzmann, of course, whose theory of change is, is represented there on his tombstone in Vienna, uh, the relationship between entropy and the log of probability, um, the second law of thermodynamics, and Darwin, um, who had a very different theory. In fact, they're actually inverse. Boltzmann was interested in the loss of order and Darwin the origin of order. And I'll focus on Darwin because I think his ideas are more relevant uh, to the institutions that we study. So here is Darwin, the, the, the first pages of The Origin of Species, published in 1859. And Darwin, like Boltzmann, wanted to discover general laws of change. And that's why he quotes William Huell the top left there. So he was very much inspired by physics. So the current tendency to abhor physics in favor of contingencies in the um, science's complexity doesn't really reflect their true origins. And uh, we all are familiar with Darwin's idea that was presented at the end of The Origin in chapter 14, where he introduces the tangled bank uh, and the laws that he has in mind to explain diversity. Um, that is the idea that everyone knows now, adaptation by natural selection. And here's a picture, well, those are the laws, and here's a picture in chapter four where he explains two things. One, continuity uh, through descent and diversification through natural selection and adaptive radiation, the vertical and horizontal axes. So there's a theory of change here, but the theory of change posits that the variation comes from the variation in the environment. But where does the environment come from? What is the theory of change of the environment? Many people realize that what Darwin had done is in his theory swept the explanandum under the carpet, that the causal mechanism was shifted into the world. But Darwin himself actually had written two books his first and his last books uh, that you, no one, I guess, in this room has read. Um, his 1842, the first scientific monograph he wrote on coral reefs, and the last posthumously pu published book on uh, earthworms, where what Darwin addressed was not so much the origin of uh, species, but the origin of selection. It's a very profound set of ideas that got ignored for about, you know, over, certainly over 100, maybe 200 years. the quote from the book. And that spirit of inquiry that tries to understand the origin of selection really re-emerged in the 1980s uh, with Richard Dawkins' book, The Extended Phenotype, and then has been pursued up until quite recently in the work of some of my colleagues, uh, Mark Feldman, John Odling Smee, um, Kevin Leyland, all external faculty members at SFI, trying to understand where the environment comes from. I like to refer to Dick Lewinton as Richard I and my former colleague at Oxford, uh, Richard Dawkin, as Richard II. He should be Richard III, uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> he was the second. <laughs> That's a joke for Shakespeare fans. Um, okay, so the idea of uh, niche, uh, niche construction or the extended phenotype is where the rules change as quickly as the objects that they govern. 
And this is not what we like to do in science. If you think about most of our mathematical formalisms, we have fixed rules. We write down our equations of motion, and we track in some appropriate coordinate space uh, the objects that are being governed by those laws. So think classical mechanics. Now, Einstein pushed that a bit because he showed there was a feedback between the objects and the forces in his general theory. But by and large, we've separated those two. But I'm gonna claim that to understand revolution, to understand true change, whoops, uh, you need to uh, consider the mathematics governing the origin of selection. You almost take a good, um, as opposed to taking fixed laws and monitoring the evolution of their objects. Uh, because I want, to do the, I want to get to the law stuff, I'm going to do this very quickly, just to say that this requires a new kind of theoretical framework um, to explain phenomena like this. Why is it that after so many years there was a very rapid shift in our attitude towards, for example, gay marriage? Why is it that after so many years of um, moralistic cant, there was such a rapid shift in our attitude towards drugs? How is it that there can be such extraordinarily rapid shifts in our political dispositions? And of course, there's data on all of these things. Um, Seatbelt usage, quite interesting. Attitudes towards the death penalty. That's a quite interesting case, by the way, because you'll see that the, even though they look periodic, or they might be periodic, the curves don't permanently cross. Whereas that's not true for our attitudes to same-sex marriage. So why does this happen? Why do we change our minds? And uh, in the 80s and 90s, Doug North, who was an economist who won the Nobel Prize in 93, got very interested in the forces shaping institutional change. And for him, it all came down to learning. That we all, in a particular environment, learn how those institutions function and change our strategies in response to them and then go on to build new institutions to reflect what we've learned. And that requires a different kind of mathematical model. Uh, here's an example of what I have in mind. I'm going to skip the math because I haven't got the time. But imagine that you support Democrats or Republicans. Um, you go to a Congress and you vocally articulate your position. Um, you simultaneously, vocally articulate your opposition to the opposition party. And the parties provide some form of propaganda or material for you to be a more effective advocate. So in other words, once the party comes into existence, it amplifies your ability to articulate its cause. So individuals down there, they constitute collectively parties, but parties have causal agency financial or propagandistic. And so that's the general framework in which one wants to understand the evolution of institutions, and one can mathematize it, and I'm gonna skip it because I really don't have time. Um, just to say that there are a range of rules by which we learn how to more effectively construct the institutions within which we operate and those learning rules, which in the short term allow us to more effectively act as advocates for our institutions, are in the long run the cause of their demise. And through these very simple kinds of models, one can recover qualitatively uh, the periodic character of the data. And the basic idea, just to give you a sense of how this works, is um, if you're favorite institution is very successful, and you reduce the effort that you invest in its support, but your opponent that's in second position increases the effort it puts into its institution, in the long run, that will induce a switch. So there's a range of behaviors which are, in the short run, economically rational. Why would I invest in an institution that's doing extraordinarily well, right? Um, it makes sense, because they're already dominant. But in the long run, that leads through a dynamic to that institution being replaced. And I suspect, by the way, that's why some of these larger universities will disappear, 
out of complacency. But, okay, let's skip that. Let me jump to, to, to the law. Too much. Um, institutions, like this one. So what is a constitution? A constitution is a rule book that essentially governs the society in which we live. Um, I got very interested in these when I went to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and, and lived in a house very close to Kurt Gödel's house. Kurt Gödel was the greatest logician of the 20th century, probably the greatest logician of all time. And he left Austria fleeing from the Nazi party. And he was keen on becoming a naturalized American. Um, and so he recruited Oscar Morgenstern and Albert Einstein to act as his sponsors. But both Morgenstern and Einstein were terrified that in the interview with the immigration officer, Gödel would find an inconsistency in the immigration logic and uh, tried to convince Gödel that he should not at all argue with the immigration officer because it would probably be uh, a failed outcome. So this is Morgan Stern's recollection of the event. And he points out with some alarm that Gödel became a scholar of constitutions. Uh, it says at the end, you know, I tried to explain that all this was totally unnecessary. Uh, but to no avail. He persisted in finding out all the facts he wanted to know about constitutions and so forth. So now he goes to um, tell Morgenstern that he's found some inner logical inconsistencies in the constitution and that it would be possible within a democratic constitution to overthrow it and turn it into a despotic constitution. And. Uh, Einstein gets very distressed, so he goes and plays the violin, which is what he did when he was anxious. Uh, they eventually go down to Trenton for the interview. The interviewer, <laughs> this, is a, this is an end of the day digression because I know you're tired. Uh, the, interviewer, um, the interviewer says, you know, so tell me, uh, Professor Gödel, why did you leave Austria? And he says, well, you know, I did live in a republic. Unfortunately, the constitution was logically inconsistent. So it was changed into a dictatorship. And the examiner says, oh, that's very bad. This could not happen in this country. And then Gödel says, no, I can prove it. And of course, Morgenstern and Einstein were absolutely mortified. But fortunately, in the end, it all worked out well. And he was naturalized in 1948. Anyway, that's why I got into constitutions. Um, so we've been asking, how are constitutions collectively written? Um, how are they transmitted? How are they enforced? This is a very large collaboration uh, with the Center at the University of Chicago. And just to quickly tell everyone in this room what we do, because you know the methods well, we take a constitution, we chop it up into bits. That is, we turn a constitution into topics. For those who don't know, a topic is something like a principal component in a text. So what you try to do is reconstruct the frequency distribution of words in your target text by a convex sum of topics. So uh, a newspaper might look like that, and then what you do is you add them up with appropriate weights to reconstruct the uh, word frequency feature vector. So here's what they might look like. So now we do the clever bit. Topic modeling is just off the shelf. We then reconstruct a diffusion graph which tells us over the course of time which topics flowed through which constitutions and for how long. This is how we do it, and that's what you get. And we can zoom in. Oops, and zoom in. So you can see there that the Egyptian constitution of 1923 was borrowed from by the Burundi constitution of 1962 and the Iraqi constitution of 1925 and so forth. So this is an inferred graph. Anyway, I'm doing pretty well, actually. I really zoomed. So this is interesting. So let's zoom in on some of those nodes. So here's how I want you to read this picture. Um, if you look in the middle, there's a focal node, a constitution, and it has constitutional parents. 
and constitutional offspring. So you can see, if you look across these constitutions, some variation. And if you look across all constitutions that have ever been written, you get this beautiful zoo of biomorphs of constitutions. Here's who those constitutions are. And you'll see that some constitutions are very fecund. You look at Canada, it's lots of offspring. Iceland's interesting, right? It has lots of parents and lots of offspring. But then you look at the infertile constitutions like Montenegro um, and the partially sterile constitutions. This is actually, it's a dangerous game, right? Because there are people out there saying, I'm gonna kill you, how dare you refer to the constitution of Montenegro as infertile. Um, and of course, there is an effect of time because most of the fecund constitutions are ancient. <laughs> that is, they all go back to 1789 which is the first written constitution, the American constitution, not the first oral constitution. And you can ask, what are the statistical regularities in these transmission motifs? Um, how many offspring does a constitution have on average? What is the distribution of offspring size? What is the distribution of parental size? What's the distribution of in-degree? What are the forces that constrain the number of offspring that a constitution could have, or parents that it could have. And this is what I would consider a rigorous attempt to get at memes, by the way, because these are truly borrowed concepts coming from pre-existing constitutions. You can do the mathematics. The Yule process was already mentioned, actually, this morning. The Yule process was actually developed to explain how many species would exist per genus. So it was actually, it's the generalized preferential attachment math mathematics. Um, so in other words, if you have a genus, you can say there's a probability P that one species within that genus will produce another, or one minus P, it'll produce a new genus. And so let's say P is close to one. A genus with many species will generate more species, right? And so that's the basic idea that Yule was trying to explain. So you get a negative binomial distribution of species per genus which is exactly what we find, by the way, in terms of the distribution of offspring of individual constitutions. Um, so the in-degree is Gaussian. So the average number of parents that any one constitution has is about six to eight. And, uh, and you'll see that the, the out-degree is negative binomial, so that some constitutions have many, many offspring, but most have one to two, which is like us. Right? We have a, essentially a Gaussian distribution of parents. It's a delta function, really, at two. Right? But in terms of the number of offspring we produce, it's, it's only bounded by time and effort. So that's the first point. Actually, constitutions are very biological. Um, there seems to be a constraint on how many constitutions they can borrow from in their construction. And there seems to be some positive feedback effect in terms of how popular you are as a model. You can also trace how those topics diffuse through the constitutions in time. And so over here, you can't really see this, but um, here's the monarchy, the lower left. So there was a lot of reference to the monarchy early on, right, in the late... 18th, early 19th century, and that disappeared obviously completely. It's not an important part of a modern constitution. But other concepts became very important, human rights, for example. So you can trace through that diffusion cascade through each individual constitution which topics are at high frequency. Here's another way of doing it. Um, there's, there's 100 dimensions here. Each one of those dimensions is a topic and the size of each of those bars is its frequency. So you'll see that actually that the 1789 constitution of the United States is very low dimensional. In terms of the um, contribution to the variability, it's dominated by two topics. And as you go forward in time, look at the Canadian constitution of 1791, much more entropic. And then you look at the French revolutionary constitutions, um, which shift from one year to another as they decapitated uh, one leader after another. So there is history actually written into these constitutions. So this is part of a, a sort of a quantitative history analysis. <laughs>
You can also cluster them in interesting ways. And what you find, by the way, so this is just a spring-embedded network where each vertex is a constitution, is that it looks like a caterpillar, and the, but you can see it's actually a one-dimensional manifold. It's essentially organized by time. Time is the governing concept of a constitution. That is, you're much more likely to borrow temporally proximate from temporally proximate constitutions. But if you cluster, you do community structure of one kind or another, you do see clusters, and what are these clusters? They're actually reflecting the growth rate of constitutions. Um, between 1800 and about, 18, and the 19, and about 1900, um, constitutions grew at about one per year. Now they're being produced at about 10 per year. And those clusters correspond to rates of constitutional production. I also want to point out that co most constitutions die after a few years in terms of their influence. There's a very famous correspondence when Thomas Jefferson was living in Paris with Madison. And Jefferson believed that constitutions should be re rewritten every generation. Madison thought the opposite. <laughs> this country has had one constitution since 1789. France got rid of their constitution after one year and has had 14. Okay. This is not that. So these are officially relabeled constitutions. These are effective longevity. So if no one ever borrows from me again, I'm dead from the point of view of influence. So this is influence longevity. And there's a beautiful pattern here, actually, that the oldest constitutions tend to be the most long-lived. Uh, don't worry about that. So just another way of illustrating this, a kind of interesting and a bit shocking to historians of constitutions, on the x-axis is the number of descendant constitutions arrayed in chronological order. And on the y-axis, when that descendant constitution was written. And so if you look at USA, it has about 20 offspring, and the last of its offspring was written in about 1875. Now, of course, the US Constitution influenced the French Constitution, which could be borrowed from rather than borrowing directly from the US. So this is direct borrowing, not borrowing by proxy. But look at the Canadian Constitution, very interesting. Um, it has fewer offspring in total, but that span a much longer period of history. And then look at Paraguay. The Paraguay Constitution is the most important constitution in the history of constitutions. By any metric. Now, if you were all patriots, you would be gunning me down by now, right? And it allows you to ask quite interesting questions about invention and innovation and influence, which defy, I think, your intuitions. Many people would say the US Constitution is the most influential by virtue of having been the first and having been borrowed from by very influential constitutions. So a sort of page rank of influence. This is uh, essentially first degree borrowing. And you can look at them all here, and you can, again, very clearly see this pattern that these um, short-lived constitutions were written rather late, which is obviously a first mover effect, a very strong effect in constitutional history. <coughs> So let me just jump to my final slide, because I think sort of text slide. Um, for us at SFI, at least, one of the neglected areas for understanding change is something that will be clear to many people in this room, which is fundamentally collective. And yet the way that history is written, written from the vantage point of presidents, or Chernow's biographies of Grant and of Madison or of Washington, the story that we hear has to do with individual pioneering minds. But I think it's very wrong, this is the point that Tolstoy made at the end of War and Peace, that we really shouldn't be focusing on Napoleon, but on the armies. Learning is very important, and we, if you like, the, the ambient field in which we operate is constantly being changed by virtue of our adaptive response to the dominant norms. And most of the modeling frameworks that we adopt, certainly in evolutionary ecology, 
take the selection pressures as fixed, right? Uh, and certainly in economic modeling, where it's even worse. Um, but of course, we're constantly modulating them because we're constantly rebuilding uh, the rules, and so how we think about learning is very important. And finally, this point again that's clear, I think, in anyone who's worked in statistical mechanics or any many body formalism is that it's often the collective modes that govern the dominant observables and not the individual preferences. But we as human beings have very limited myopic insight into those collective characteristics. And so we still reason through problems as if our individual contributions are the most important and not the mechanics of the system itself. So I think we need to start developing an intuition for the collectives of systems with a new vocabulary because the vocabulary we have is a legacy from biography. So with that I end, thank you very much. I could almost sit on this. Um, really fascinating stuff. Very cool. Love your graphics, by the way. Thank you. So I'm curious, you know, if a country is building its constitution based on a set of elements from other constitutions, you could probably also see similar.